If you ever invited people over and the meat took way too long to cook, that's exactly what happened to me with this elk shank, and I'll show you the mistake I made and how I fixed it in the end. My buddy called me up and asked me if I wanted an elk shoulder, and of course I told him yes, because elk is some of the best meat around. I butchered most of it, sent some of it to the butcher to get ground, but I purposely saved the elk shank, which was essentially the forearm. It has a ton of connective tissue, and I wanted to cook it low and slow with you. And this is how I did it. This elk shank is 16 inches long and about six pounds. And I wanted the natural flavor of the elk to shine through, so I'm not gonna go too crazy with the rub. All I'm doing is a simple one with salt, pepper, and garlic, with the plan to add some extra flavor right before I serve it. Then I let the rub soak in while getting the kettle up to temperature. I'm hoping to eat the elk shank for dinner tonight, and that meant I had to start the fire before the sun came up, but luckily for me, everything was ready just at first light. I was able to get it on the grill for about four hours at low and slow temperatures, or 225 degrees, so we can get that smoky flavor locked in before we go to the next step. I've been cooking the elk shoulder for about four hours on the kettle, and it's reached 140 degrees internal, but it's starting to dry out. And we knew that would happen because there's no fat because they're very lean. And so we're gonna pull out our secret weapon. We're gonna braise this thing just like we would with a brisket to get it extra tender and moist. I'm using a turkey roaster pan to hold in all the juices and I added some onion as well as a pint of beef broth. Then we wrap the whole thing up with aluminum foil and that'll keep all the moisture inside so that way we can get that meat fort tender and all of that connective tissue will break down and make it really amazing. I also suggest using gloves when you close or open the foil after the first time because steam burns are not any fun. So it's been a few hours and the only thing that I've had to do is add a little bit more charcoal to the SNS to keep the temperatures up and I flipped the meat over just to help things cook a little bit more evenly. And about an hour ago, the meat reached 203 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the temperature I like to pull my brisket at. But when I pulled out the probe and tested it, it was still tough as nails. It's been another hour, things are starting to loosen up, which is why you always wanna use the probe and not go by temperature alone. If you're wondering what it's supposed to feel like when you know that it's done, take your probe and stick it in a tub of peanut butter. That's about the right resistance. If it's more than that, you're not done yet. You gotta wait a little bit longer. At this point in the video, I've made a pretty big mistake, but I haven't realized it yet, so I wanted to give you a little bit of the backstory how I got in this mess and how I ended up pulling it off in the end. I had a friend call and invite us over for dinner, but I'd already started making the elk shank, so it was too late, and I did the nice thing and invited them over instead. And that's where I messed up. I had them come over early enough that I didn't have a good enough buffer in case things didn't go the way that I had planned. And I hadn't accounted for that extra hour after I reached the temperature where I thought things would be done before things started getting tender, but I did two things right that ended up saving in the end. And the first one feels a little bit cliche, but it's if you're looking, you're not cooking. Every time you lift up that lid and peel back the foil, you're letting heat out and that heat is not cooking the meat. So it takes a little while for the kettle to get back up to temperature so you can get rolling again. And at that point, I knew I wasn't gonna overcook the meat, so I left the lid on for as long as I could until I absolutely had to pull it off to get dinner ready on time. And the second tip is a little bit of a trick and you'll see it done at some barbecue restaurants. If you slice it thin, it's gonna be a lot more tender than it really is. And that is what made the biggest difference. So with that, let's get back to the video. So with the meat just about ready, I'm gonna take some of those drippings and make some gravy, which is gonna go really well with the potatoes that we're fixing up too. Making gravy with this method is incredibly easy. You just need a couple of tablespoons of melted butter and add a couple of tablespoons of flour. Then get out your tiny whisk and continue mixing it up while it cooks for a minute or so to get rid of the taste of the raw flour. At this point, add about a cup of the elk drippings and mix it all together. If it's too thick, add a little bit more drippings and keep mixing it until it's about as thick as you'd like. The most important part is a teaspoon of salt, rosemary, and garlic powder to amp up the flavor of the gravy and then take it off the heat. The clock has run out and it's time for dinner. The elk had been resting for about 10 minutes while I made up the gravy at this point and I made the decision to slice it thin rather than trying to pull it since it was not fork tender. That gave me some really tender, flavorful slices that you'd never know that they came from an underappreciated cut. Add some roasted asparagus, sweet potatoes, and regular potatoes, and dinner is served. It's all done and has the gravy on top. All we need to do is have the taste test. That herb gravy really pulled everything together, and it is amazing what you can do if you know how to cook things. You can take just about anything, including the hardest working muscle on the elk, and make it into something nice and tender and delicious. And if you want to see more videos about big game, go check out my video all about making jerky with elk.